Welcome to Be the Wolf. This is Varg Freeborn, your host for the Be the Wolf show, where we talk about many topics including violence, training, conditioning, etiquette, and all things required to be a leader and own your position in this world. Because if it is yours but you cannot defend it, you do not own it. Today's episode, which is the first, will cover a couple of topics uh, that have been on my mind and some things that I've done recently that were uh, of great value in learning experiences and teaching moments. Um, of course, as you know, I uh, run my training program here in Northeast Ohio, dealing primarily with lethal force, and I also um, spend quite a bit of time as a student, so we've had a, quite a few things happen recently that I think are pretty interesting, uh, and I think you'll find them interesting as well. I uh, recently completed eight days of CQB training with John Chapman and John Spears at Forge Tactical, uh, which was held at the Alliance Police Training Facility. And I have a ton of stuff to cover from that. I can probably talk about that over several episodes, um, including what team training teaches the solo operator uh, and why instructors should learn team training um, or team tactics, rather. Um, I'd also like to talk today about attention versus focus, uh, what the difference is between the two and how how that difference applies to everything from training down to spatial awareness and gross versus fine motor skills, which I have done a lot of thinking about this week. Um, also recently went and seen the, the movie American Assassin. I've got a few words about that and probably talk about why I focus so much on the high order predator since I've been getting a lot of questions about that lately. Uh, so I'll try to cover all that today. Um, First, I'd like to talk about my eight days of training with Forge. Uh, Forge Tactical is the ongoing legacy of EAG. Uh, John Spears and John Chapman were, of course, EAG cadre with Pat Rogers, and they wanted to continue that training legacy um, and basically started Forge to accomplish that, as I understand it. They have basically taken the EAG curriculum and um, and made it their own, and they've got some new courses, and uh, they have the most amazing way of teaching uh, team tactics that I think uh, a person could absolutely experience. Uh, I am not a law enforcement or, or military personnel. However, um, I have had some experience with uh, team tactics and uh, special operations training uh, from other experienced people. So I have a little bit to, um, let's say, compare it to. Uh, however, having been instructed by a lot of different people throughout the years, I think that there is enough basis in my own experience uh, to look at an instruction type and say this is good or this is bad. Um, I don't think that there is a, a direct need for um, uh, experience in doing the application to spot a good or bad instructor. With that being said, I would have to say that of all the instruction I've had in, in anything that I've done from fitness to combatives and different styles of martial arts and boxing uh, to the various people I've trained under in gunfighting, uh, I would say that John Chapman and John Spears are two of the most phenomenal teachers you will ever encounter in your lifetime. And if you have an opportunity to train with them, you should take it. If you don't have an opportunity to train with them, you should make it. Uh, and that's exactly how I feel about that. So we did TMR CQB for the first four days and CQB operations for the second four days. It was eight days total. Uh, the first day was trauma medical, uh, tactical medical responder, rather. Um, 
so we learned basic uh, tourniquet application on self and buddy aid. Uh, we did vehicle extractions, um, tactical vehicle extractions, so taking into consideration taking fire or um, other uh, dangerous uh, circumstances happening at the time of the extraction. Uh, so we did some some pretty interesting things there. Uh, we had a couple of uh, really amazing um, guest instructors come in for that part, and Cato, who I had the pleasure of meeting that day, uh, was our primary instructor for the medical or the the tactical medicine um, portion of the course, which he emphasized that there was no medicine in that. Uh, there was no medical part of that. Um, so there's some terminology things there that people need to understand. Uh, it's not medical training. It's um, self-aid, buddy aid uh, for saving someone's life or buying you or, your, or somebody you care about some time. Um, and I really recommend that you do get some type of training. There's a lot of people that are carrying tourniquets and, and carrying med kits that have no idea how to use any of it. So it doesn't do you any good. Uh, it's, it's literally carrying a tourniquet you've never put on is literally like carrying a gun that you have no idea which side the bullets come out of. There's just literally, it's just like that. Um, so that, that gun that you wouldn't know which end the bullets come out of is just as useful to you as that tourniquet is that you don't understand how to correctly put on. Uh, so you should do that. So that was day one of our training. And then day two through four of the first four days went into, um, CQB, which is shoot house and fighting inside of structures. Um, and, uh, Forge has this phenomenal way of putting shapes and angles into, um, a very understandable format and if you are someone who works on a team or in any situation like that where you might have to go in with a partner um, understanding angles of exposure versus angles of coverage and the geometric shapes that you have to deal with will make that job a whole lot safer for you um, and there's a lot that I that I take back for the solo operator since my instruction primarily I deal with average American citizens who are not cops or military a lot of them are ex-military um, and I have quite a few retired cops in my uh, in my alumni um, but they're basically going to be out there by themselves someday um, if something bad happens it'll be them inside their house or them out in the, in the world somewhere at uh, the restaurant or the movie theater uh, operating by themselves. Um, and I can tell you that, you know, seeing teams flow through these problems really made it very clear to me um, how to explain it to the single guy. Uh, and since I've been teaching that for quite a while uh, with my experience, with my personal experience with home invasions and dealing with angles of attack uh, in my own um time in hostile environments uh, things that I learned synced up really really well with everything that uh, Forge teaches in their team tactics stuff so the first uh, the first CQB course we did was two man teams um, we ran that for three days uh, two man teams including a low light section which is really phenomenal that was a live fire portion uh, so everything for that three days was live fire um, using um, real ammunition and uh, rifles as our primary carbines as our primary weapons so when we go into the second four days uh, there was a slight change of um, attendees uh, a lot of the people that were in the CQB um, shoot house course were not ready for CQB operations uh, CQB operations is more of a vetted course uh, and you do have to have a real your, your fundamental weapons manipulations and uh, fundamental skills need to be pretty firmly in place before you go into CQB operations with uh, with Forge so I will give you that warning right off the bat um, attend a CQB shoot house and let them say yay or nay on you going forward because that's going to be the determining factor um, there were a few people that had trouble in the CQB um, shoot house course that would have been smoked completely out um, on that last four days. 
So uh, spend your time on your fundamentals and your weapons manipulations and learn what they need uh, because make ready um, to them is definitely uh, uh, not always the same as make ready to whoever taught you to make ready. Um, workspace and all this stuff, it can be very different. Dealing with a shoot house with a catwalk, uh, there is no workspace with muzzle up. Um, because you have teammates that are often teammates and instructors often up on the catwalk, so it's a safety thing. Um, you can argue artificiality and say, "Well, that's not that's not you know exactly legitimately a real mock up of what it would be like." So you're you know developing training scars, and I'll call bullshit on that because uh, having been inside the house, inside real houses in the neighborhood with guns with teammates um, during CQB operations. I know that very often I had teammates upstairs, um, and there's nothing but uh, a thin wood floor and some two by fours between us. That I have no doubt that my uh, my two two three would have cleared um, and fragmented through the through that floor pretty easily um, into into teammates. So there is no artificiality to a make ready position. Um, I think that they're all valid. And whatever the instructor causes you to learn at that moment is important for you to learn. What's more important is your ability to adapt. Um, one lesson that I think came out of the first four days for me was watching someone uh, in particular that struggled with the course due to training scars and due to um, having done you know run and gun shootouts training where uh, everything is going and shoot everything. You know, um, and you might have some no shoots, but it, everything is busted and shoot everything. And and this particular person had had done a ton of that stuff. Um, you know, a, a literal ton of uh, a bunch of breach and gun away uh, type of training. And when they got introduced to actually having to process their environment, open the door, process the environment. Uh, process the things that you're seeing, the problems that you're seeing. Is there furniture? Are there blind spaces where uh, someone could be hiding? Uh, what are the priority of threats that are facing me in this room? Open doors, closed doors, um, blind spots, uh, you know, dead spaces behind furniture. Um, taking the time to process that while also processing and neutralizing threats uh, in the appropriate order. Uh, when this individual was faced with that, they were completely lost. Um, and that's really indicative to a serious problem in training. Uh, and when this, and when this person gave their AAR at the end of that course, that first four days, uh, they basically said that they had wasted a ton of money on and wished that they had never taken any of the other training they had taken. Um, which says a lot for forge. Um, but also, it, it was uh, it was very important to watch that and see someone get literally broken down by by very experienced instructors and then and then reconstructed properly and it was a painful experience for that person at sometimes uh, at some points where they the instructors basically had to say you know you do not have the basic weapons manipulation skills to accomplish the tasks that's being given to you that's a very painful thing for someone to hear who shoots literally every week and trains every month and has done a, a ton of training. That is a very tough thing to hear. Um, but you have to hear that if you're, if you're screwed up, you're screwed up and you have to get it together. Um, and courses that cause you to think courses that are low round count that cause you to think are where you learn how to fight. Courses that are high round count and are very low on decision making are not where you learn how to fight. And the courses with John Chapman and, and John Spears, you learn how to fight. So that's the best way I can put it for for that um, for that differentiation of the type of training that, that you can get there. The second four days uh, was CQB operations, which, of course, uh, I already explained that you have to be a little bit more tuned up to get into that. And that's where we go into large team or full team training. 
uh, no longer working with two man teams you start out with you know four and six man teams and then move up to 10 to 12 man teams um, by the end of the course we were flowing through houses and buildings um, as a full 10 11 man team um, and doing it pretty effortlessly there were some hiccups and you can't take anybody and make them a master in four days um, however uh, Chappie and Spears did a phenomenal job at making a very cohesive and effective team in that short amount of time. Um, the Shoot House at Alliance is, of course, one of the, the premier places to train. Uh, it, it's a world-class facility, and Joe Wire is a, is a world-class guy. Um, he's a super gentleman uh, and a very nice dude. Um, he often has messy hair, but other than that, he's, uh, he's a pretty good guy. Um, that facility really lends itself well to the way that they, they teach. Uh, one of the observations that I got out of that course was, um, validation is the last day on validation day. We go out with UTM training rounds and we fight in actual houses in Alliance. Um, so because the training is tied in through the Alliance Police Department, uh, we get the use of abandoned houses and buildings in Alliance, uh, typically in, you know, not so great neighborhoods. And uh, we get to roll up in full kit and pour out and go and, and hit up some bad guys inside of these uh, abandoned churches, abandoned houses, stuff like that. Um, the shoot house in Alliance is very big and has very large rooms. They're not realistic like uh, a house. They're they're more realistic like um, a commercial building or an office building than they are a house. And I've heard people complain about that before, and I thought it was a valid complaint because they're like, because guys would always say, as I've taken other CQB courses there with EAG and, and Chappie, um, I've heard people complain that, uh, you know, these rooms aren't a realistic size. So uh, it's not like that when you go out into the houses. It's just, you know, it's much smaller. Some of these houses have tiny hallways and tiny stairways and things like that. Um, and one of the biggest takeaways for me from that from that entire class was if you can flow through the larger spaces you will be able to more easily flow through the smaller spaces as a team however if all you trained was in small spaces if the shoot house was realistic quotation marks um, when you got thrown into a big open space you'd be pretty lost and I think that really stands out um, and I'm pretty sure the guys designed everything that way with that shoot house, uh, knowing these things ahead of time. But it's really true. If you train in small spaces, when you get thrown into a large space with lots of angles and lots of open shapes, you are going to be lost, especially as a team. You will not know where to put people. Um, because you're so used to working in a small space, it's much easier. Uh, it's much easier to contain. It's much easier to put people where they need to be you can only fit so many people in a place so there's no there's a lot of decisions that are made for you in a small space whereas a large space moving through as a team uh you have to make a lot of decisions i get all this area where do i put people where are the angles of exposure where are my angles of coverage how do i equal these angles out how how do i see the shapes as they are even though we're talking instead of a an l hallway that's literally six feet forward and, and three feet right now i've got 25 yards forward and, and 25 yards right in an industrial building or, or 20 yards forward and 10 yards right in a church uh, you know and, and we're dealing with a room that's uh, you know 20 yards wide or you know 25 yards wide or bigger in some cases uh, so you know the level of thought that's put into some of these courses is just is really phenomenal um, and uh I think it's very important that um, that that you try to reach this level of training if you are one of a couple of things. If you are a professional 
who carries a gun for a living, there's no good reason why you're not taking this. And there are a lot of bad reasons uh, why you are not taking this type of training. Um, if you are an instructor that teaches people, even if you do not teach team tactics, which you shouldn't if you you know haven't had an, an extreme amount of training and vetting in that, um, and, and at least some experience in it, uh, but even if you teach just individuals and concealed carry, um, you should learn team tactics for a couple of reasons. I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But um, so it, it's highly recommended um, for several reasons. Uh, but the moving through spaces thing was uh, was a big epiphany for me um, to understand that, you know, working the larger space is a harder problem. And once you learn how to, but it's easier to see the shapes in a larger space sometimes uh, when you're just learning it and you've never been exposed to it before. So it just the whole thing is just brilliantly put together between Alliance and and Forge and you know the people who are involved in who have been involved in that entire process the last you know several years. Um, it's brilliant. It's n it's nothing short of brilliant the way it's put together. Um, and you will learn a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of things from them that you should definitely travel out for to get. <clears throat> so validation day on the last day, as I said, we go out into, uh, we worked in an abandoned church and we worked uh, some abandoned houses and they have bad guys hiding with UTM rounds and they have uh, very specific Instructions of when to attack, how to attack, whether to attack or not, and things of that nature. So I really uh, enjoyed that. Um, what I didn't enjoy as much was that it turned out to be one of the hottest <laughs> indexing heat uh, heat index um, days for a September. Uh, it was above 80 in the heat index, uh, maybe pushing 90 at, at one point, I think. And because we're dealing with UTM rounds, we had to wear not only all of our gear, which is plate carrier, armor, you know, rifle plates, uh, helmet, ballistic helmet, um, ear pro, and, you know, all of the belt, the, the gun belt, your ammo, all of your gear, carrying, you know, different stuff, flashbang, uh, trainers, all this stuff. So you're wearing all of that. Plus, because it's UTM, you're wearing a hoodie underneath the plate carrier and a scarf around your neck and a full gas mask, uh, which made it extremely difficult to breathe with all that hot stuff on. Plus, you have a gas mask on, uh, which does not aspirate like not having a mask on. It's just very different. Um, it's much harder to get a full breath in, especially when you have a plate carrier constricting on your chest and... Um, you know, all these layers of clothing uh, and full gloves and everything. Uh, so that part was not as enjoyable, uh, but it was a good training moment because we get into this uh, process where we're sitting in the van staging in this hot van for 20, 25 minutes uh, waiting for the target to be ready. Uh, and then we roll and hit the target. So by the time you're going to hit the target, you're already stressed because you, you've been having difficulty breathing in the back of this hot van for 20 minutes and you're wondering if you're going to die anyway. Uh, so when you get out um, and get, then you have to go and get in a gunfight, which is great. So um, there were several key factors to that that really helped to push the validation part of the training over the edge and into spectacular levels when you can get yourself tested and stressed to such a point that you actually learn something new about yourself and about how you react that's very important uh, as some of you know I have uh, quite a history with violence and I've been in some very hostile dangerous environments for long periods of time um, so I do know how to operate at those levels and I, and it's deeply ingrained in me. So it's very hard for me to find training that pushes me to that level, uh, or past that level or to, uh, to some place that I've never been psychologically. Um, I had previously thought it was impossible to find that level of training. 
However, that was presented to me this past week in CQB operations. Um, a couple of the things that I noticed, um, a gas mask will artificially narrow your field of vision. That causes a couple of problems. That caused me a problem of getting online with my partners. Um, the reason that caused my problem uh, was because I have a very highly developed spatial awareness uh, that comes from fighting in very hostile, deadly environments um, and dealing with very dangerous people um, that will attack you from concealment and use ambush. Um, when you're exposed to that for long times, you develop a spatial awareness that get, I can't explain if you don't experience it, but it's a very, very high. Uh, and you, what it means is you're very aware of who's in your area and how they're moving. Um, so when I would take, uh, I would catalog who's in my area. Um, I would not see my teammates in my peripheral vision which would allow me to think I was online when actually I'd be a little bit behind them um, because I couldn't see them past the side of the gas mask. Um, so they could actually be a little bit in front of me and uh, I wasn't aware of it because I thought because I couldn't see them that I was online. And so what I did not do was employ the, the cliché which for this particular circumstance is not a cliche of keeping your head on a swivel. Uh, when your field of vision is narrowed by some artificial um, uh, implement, you have to keep your head on a swivel literally to see the things around you because you lose your peripheral vision. Um, what I learned from that is that you cannot rely on your peripheral vision and you should not even when you don't have something on your face that's limiting your peripheral vision. Uh, your peripheral vision is only good for seeing um, things that are either standing still or moving rapidly. Uh, you will not catch subtle movements in your peripheral vision. Uh, subtle movements are often cues that let you know that a, that a rapid or dangerous movement is about to happen. So you see where I'm going with this. You don't see those subtle movements, you don't see those cues, and then you don't see the action when it takes place in time to compensate for it, such as a partner moving um, slightly in front of you or something like that. Um, at no point do I, do I believe I broke the uh, muzzle behind meat rule where my muzzle was actually behind or beside their body. However, um, there was an issue in the beginning of the... Um, of the live uh, runs that uh, I had to really work hard to correct because that narrow field of vision really screwed up my ability to um, put my feet where they needed to be. Um, and that bothered me a lot because I typically am pretty good about stuff like that. Um, and I consider myself to be um, pretty, pretty squared away in terms of operating around other people in close proximity to me. So that was a very interesting experience. Uh, and uh, again, you know, thanks to Forge for uh, making that happen. <coughs> because that, uh, that definitely um, was a great experience to take that opportunity to be pushed outside of my, my, my normal levels even though my normal levels are much higher than the average person to be able to be pushed outside of that and learn something new about myself. Um, and that's why I went, that's why I go to training like that and I'll keep going back. Um, so with that in mind, um, I'll segue into, uh, just basically saying that, uh, the, the, the training was excellent. I had a great time. Um, it was hard. It was 74 hours and eight days. 
um, not counting prep time and driving time. So um, it was probably a 90-hour week for me, but 74 hours of training with uh, Chappie was, uh, and Spears was just a phenomenal experience, and uh, I, I feel really tuned up. My hands are calloused from so much rifle handling, which makes me very happy because I don't spend a whole lot of time on the rifle because I'm uh, primarily um, a pistol carrier um, as a civilian, so a rifle is not my primary weapon. Uh, as much as we would like it to be, um, it's never going to be very close by when 99% of things that are likely to happen, happen. So that being said, it was a great course, and you should get into their CQB courses if you can. Um, segueing into team training and what it teaches you about solo Operation and why instructors should learn team tactics. So I've had this belief for quite a, quite a while, and anybody that's attended any of my firearms courses knows that I, I push this term that I call advanced safety. And basically, I consider advanced safety to be one of the martial principles that... Uh, I believe need to be adhered to by all things that you do in in your capacity as a uh, defender in a fight. Advanced safety basically is kind of like the uh, the uh, HIPAA laws that you know or the first rule of medical um, do no harm. Uh, you need to be doing things that 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 do not put you in a position to do more harm. Uh, and if you get into a fight in Applebee's or the movie theater or somewhere like that, and you can't control yourself and you can't control your muzzle uh, at a high level of stress and under a great amount of duress, uh, you cannot control your muzzle, your finger, um, all of these types of things about your awareness, uh, understanding where people are, your peripheral vision, uh, your spatial awareness, all these things. If you cannot control those things, you are putting yourself in a position to do more harm. Uh, you could possibly shoot um, innocent people and um, get yourself into trouble. Cost someone their life that didn't deserve it. So, what can team tactics teach you about that? And the answer is, it teaches you everything about that. Because I know how to operate at a, at a high level with a gun in my hand around other people that I don't want to shoot. For example, my teammates. What that does is translates directly over to operating around anyone who doesn't need shot. The primary difference is that my teammate will or should know what to do to stay out of my lane and also to assist. That's the difference. Your family member or your kids or the strangers sitting at the next table uh, when a gunfight breaks out are not going to know those things. So it requires a higher level of, of spatial awareness and of uh, cataloging who's in your environment and which way they likely could go when the gunfire starts is required for the person operating solo. It is much harder. Um, everything is harder by yourself, and that's just a fact. Uh, I teach a home defense course where I teach basic shapes and angles, and I tell people at the beginning of that course and all through the day that you should not clear a building or a house or your house by yourself unless you are going to save a family member that needs you right now. Uh, if you do not need to go out into that problem, there is no reason that you should do that because there is no way that one person can, can equalize all of the dangerous angles with angles of coverage. So the same thing exists for being out in the public or with your family and getting into a gunfight. There is no way that 
you can make sure that all of the people who are going to be around you are going to know how to conduct themselves in that moment. So you have to be at a higher level of operation than you would even if you're in a team guy. Uh, if you're a team guy that operates with other guys that are trained, you can delegate in that situation. You can come up and say top of a T, he takes right, you take long, you've got yours covered, he's got his covered. If one of you gets into trouble, the other can step online and assist. Everybody knows their job. So you delegate, you take long, you take this, you do that, everybody knows, or you just call out the shape, L, if I'm on the outside, I take it this way, you're on the inside, you take it that way. We just know how it works. Whereas the person that's with you or sitting next to you or the people around you at the mall, if a shooting starts, they're not going to know those things. So it's all going to be on you to understand not only what you need to do to solve problems, but also watching out for everyone else who doesn't know how to solve any problems. They're going to create more problems for you. So you have to see problems developing before they develop and already have a solution for it by the time it gets to you. Uh, and that's a very important concept. Um, Chappie and those guys cover that in CQB training, but they cover it in a flow format, which means, you know, momentum, as as they explain it, is um, is not it's not velocity. It's it's maintaining movement without hesitations, and and that means solving problems on your way to the problem so that you have the solution when you arrive and you continue to move through it and then begin to solve the next problem before you get to it or it gets to you. That's how you achieve momentum is by eliminating hesitations and breaks in your activity. Um, at, at momentum has nothing to do with velocity. It has everything to do with just force moving forward. Um, so the same thing happens in... Uh, for the individual operating by themselves out somewhere, you need to understand how to, how do people move, how to start to build your awareness to be at a level where you can do a couple of things. First of all, you need to understand basic weapons manipulations to a high level. And what I mean by that is the muzzle positions primarily and your finger and safety. So where that gun is pointing at any time could be the least safe direction or an unsafe direction. Um, and that can change. And so a lot of people are arguing about, and, and I've taught this for a long time on my range, and guys that have attended my, uh, people who have attended my classes can vouch for this, what I'm about to say. Um, there's no right or wrong in muzzle up or muzzle down carry positions or ready positions um, what there is is circumstantial um, you know justification for it so what happens when I'm going muzzle up um, you know it might be a situation where I've got uh, family members or someone upstairs from me um, and if I'm if something happens at Dairy Queen and it's summertime and a baseball game just let out and the notorious uh, team of eight year old kids are at the Dairy Queen getting their post baseball game ice cream, do you think muzzle down would be a good idea in that environment? Um, no, because you'd be muzzling chests and heads of little eight year old kids. So. The position, the direction of your muzzle is not a fixed state of good or bad. It is circumstantially driven, um, and I've taught this for a long time. That is also covered in, you know, Forge's classes and everything that, that I've seen taught at, um, at, at the Alliance facility. So the purpose of team tactics starts to embed that. It really starts to embed that weapons manipulation. Um, the other thing that you need to know is trigger control and safety. So trigger control and safety are more of a problem when things are moving fast and you're in a very un uncertain environment. 
everybody trains on the square range. And some people do no-shoot drills. Some, not many, do no-shoot drills. Um, and most of what you see on the range is, uh, is not training to fight. Um, especially the high round count stuff and lots of movement and people hitting you with stupid stuff, you know, physically hitting you, throwing water on you. It's just ridiculous. Um, learning how to solve problems and make decisions is fighting. Uh, that's learning how to fight. So when it comes to finger and safety, um, and I mean your physical safety on your gun, if you have a rifle, that, that safety needs to be engaged at all times unless I have target acquisition and I'm just, I'm making the decision to take a shot. Um, but I have target acquisition. My sight is on the target and I have a clear shot and I'm prepping for that shot. That's when my finger goes on the trigger and my safety has been disengaged. Um, I carry uh, a Glock as do many other people uh, for a, a handgun which doesn't have any physical safety. So the finger on the trigger is the decision. Um, and prepping that shot cannot happen until you have a clear target acquisition. So the team tactics training is very, very important for that um, because you have rules that you cannot break. Uh, if you have a couple of people moving around in your area that do not need shot, it becomes very, very important when you make that decision to raise that weapon and take that safety off and put that and make that finger contact that trigger. Um, these are decisions that you cannot learn on on basic square range stuff. Um, I try to duplicate some of that on my range with some of the training implements that I have, like the little mock up of the of the shapes and hallway um, that I have, and some barricade drills that I do. Um, where I always trip people up and, and cause them to shoot um, hostages because I know they're going to shoot hostages because they can't make decisions. And I'll talk all day long about you have to make these decisions. You have to make these decisions. You have to clearly identify your angles. You have to look at what you're looking at, not look for something. Look at what you're looking at and identify it. Um, and I'll talk about that all day long. And at the end of the day, we'll do validation. And I run the hallway drill, what I call the hallway drill, where they turn the corner and they're going to go down a hallway looking for a bad guy in a certain color shirt. Um, and he's actually right there. And he's got two hostages behind him, which has happened before. Um, and they either miss him and hit the hostages or they shoot straight through him Um you know, between his legs or, or, you know, through his arm and, you know, and hit hostages. But the, but the point is, is that they didn't process what they were looking at. So it's, it's evidence that no amount of square range training is ever going to give you that practice to make those decisions. You have to set up those drills and scenarios. And the more realistic it is, the better off it is. Um, now, where team tactics training comes into that is that it gives you the opportunity to make those decisions, but it, 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 it adds the stressors of, of people moving around in your environment that you need to be aware of before you make those decisions. You cannot just jump out there and start gunning. You have to understand where are my teammates? Who's in that other room? Is somebody operating on the other side of that wall? What do I need to think about in terms of where my muzzle goes up or down? Um, do I have people upstairs? If I've got two rooms in front of me, a team has entered the room on the right, does that mean I'm going to go into the room on the left? No, because I've got a thin wall there that these rifles can penetrate. So why would I expose myself to a possible gunfight in the next room or go in and get into a gunfight in this room and shoot through the wall and hit one of my teammates? How is that any different than thinking about where your kid's bedroom is? Or or if you go out and be the hero and you want to be like, stay here, honey, let me go check this out because I hear a noise. You go out into the next room, get into a gunfight, the gunfight spins around, or the bad guy's shooting at you, you're standing against the wall that your wife is laying in bed on the other side of. You've just exposed her to a gunfight. Um, 
these are the things that they, that people don't think about. Now, I've been teaching stuff like this for quite a while. Unfortunately, I, you know, I only reach so many people. Um, but I do, while team tactics training does not talk about stuff like this specifically, it develops the basic principles and the basic skills, the fundamental skills that build those abilities, those capabilities to take those things into consideration when you're making decisions. Um, how many people would think about that? I know I've taught several um, uh, classes where I've had people come up to me afterwards and say, uh, I'm glad you talked about how Double Up Buck will penetrate multiple walls um, because I have a shotgun in my house, which everybody knows I'm not a fan of shotguns, especially for home defense. Um, but they have a shotgun in their house, and they never, ever thought about not shooting in the direction of their kid's bedroom. It's ridiculous. Like, the interior walls of your house are nothing. Literally, literally, materially, just a minimal barrier to something like double hot buck or nine millimeter slugs or or even um five five six or two two three even though that will fragment quicker uh and probably is a great choice um for of of any of those things the the five five six ballistically is probably the the safest choice for interior um uh c q b fighting however uh you still need to consider like You've got people in other rooms, you know, and I've talked to people that literally had plans. Their their defense plan was to shoot down a hallway um, that their kids' room might be on the other side, like might be in the field of fire at the end of that hallway, uh, on the other side of the wall at the end of the hallway, and had to come up to me and say, I can't believe I used to think that. I can't believe, I'm so glad I took your class because I, I might have shot my own kid. Um that's the kind of shit I'm talking about. And if you're an instructor that teaches individuals, you need to understand stuff like this. Um, because you've never operated at that level before, you don't know these things, so it's not a big deal. But if you can't admit to yourself and to other people that you don't know this stuff, then uh, you need to fix that ego issue first before you go out and take care of that problem. Um, the other thing is... Uh, Attention versus focus. Uh, it's kind of related to um, the team tactics, uh, but it's also its own subject. So um, we'll deal with it as its own subject. So to close out team tactics, uh, I would say that in previous years, I used to think that going to train like that was unnecessary for most people. And I think that most people will not achieve the level of fundamental skills and weapon, weapons manipulations to be able to operate in training at that higher level. However, I think instructors can extrapolate a lot from that. And as an instructor, you should be able to operate at that higher level. You should go out and get the training and then bring that back by extrapolating the necessary principles for people to apply to begin to cultivate the capabilities of spatial awareness and understanding where things are at in space around them that they don't need to shoot and how to conduct themselves with muzzle direction and finger and safety control in order to operate quickly and make decisions quickly and rapidly while things are changing around them environmentally and circumstantially. That is your job as an instructor. And if you're not going out and learning things as an instructor and you're just sitting up pontificating about all the shit that you know every month or every week or however often you run your training, you're worthless as an instructor. Uh, and I know that's harsh and uh, I mean it to be harsh because never once, uh, even as a person who has put many holes in other men and has spilled a lot of blood on this earth, um, do I think for one minute that there's things out there that I don't need to learn? So, uh, I don't think that other people, especially people that haven't even been in real fights should ever reach a point to where you're sitting back and saying, Oh, uh, I don't need to learn. I've been, uh, 
you know, this or that, or I was a ranger or I was whatever, you know, I, I don't care what you were. Um, there's always something to be improved upon. There's always new knowledge being learned. There's always new techniques and tactics being developed. There is always data being pushed up from the field, from people who are working hard to vet these things out and training environments and in actual application um, that you can learn from. You don't know everything. I don't know everything. Nobody does. And if you start to think you're special, you're full of yourself and you're not special. Um, so get out there and instructors um, start to look at you know higher levels of learning that apply uh, advanced safety to people. It's not all about shooting paper targets. Uh, I would say that 90% of it is not about shooting at all. Uh, it's about decision making and recognition of what's going on in your environment and the circumstances around you. And conclusion is team tactics go the longest distance in teaching those things of any other option that I've seen. Attention versus focus. I've of, I've often taught, and I and I think some people have read the um, the article that I've pushed out. That I wrote an article for primary and secondary uh, that talked about uh, situational awareness and wideband situational awareness, in particular, what I refer to wideband. Um, and the reason I call it wideband is because it is the widest band of reception possible for me to pick up. That is as opposed to a very narrow, focused, intense band of, of uh, attention. Chappie said something in the class this past week that uh, resonated with, with me talking about wideband situational awareness and, and how to divide your attention um, between multiple things. When I talk about enjoy the time that you're out, don't have to be this guy that has to sit facing the door and intently stare at everybody that comes in the door and let everybody know, including you need your wife or your, your girlfriend to see you being this, this watchful, you know, hunter uh, and everybody's got to know, and they, you love it when people are like, oh, you're the kind of guy that has to sit facing the door, huh? Yes, because I'm the protector. Bullshit. Um, relax and, and enjoy your time with your family. Uh, the odds are that nothing is going to happen, so enjoy what is happening. Uh, spend the time with your family. Now, that is not saying that you should not pay attention to what's going on. What I am saying is that you don't need a narrow band of focus on a particular area until it's needed. I used to um, live in environments where people, you know, could possibly want to kill me. And, and there were times people wanted to kill me. And uh, there were times people tried to kill me. And I was able to eat, sleep, work, do whatever in those environments. Um to the point to where I could lay down and close my eyes and be like, well, I'm going to sleep now. If somebody wants to kill me, uh, if you're really, really good, you're going to get the opportunity to. If you're not good and I get to live, I, I will be up and counter-killing you very quickly. Uh, and that was just how, that was just the mentality. Um, so... It's no different when I go into Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, I sit down. I don't, you know. I'm, I mean, I, I try to face the direction of the doors if I can. But if not, I'm less stressed out about it. Turn on the wideband situational awareness. I take a noise print of the normal noise levels of the room, of the environment, and uh, if there's any alterations in that, I will take notice very quickly. Until then, I will focus on the uh, the pretty girl that I'm with, or my family, or whatever it is that I happen to be doing at the time. So, when we talk about attention, Chappie, the thing that Chappie said, and I'm finally getting to it, was that attention can be divided and focus is, is intense. That makes so much sense um, based on 
the, the things that I already know and what I've been teaching about wideband situational awareness. Attention can be divided. Focus is, is precision. Attention can be divided. We should be paying attention to multiple things. And it is possible to pay attention to multiple things. I think that training should be done at an attention level and focus should be trained to be used by choice. So one of the things that we know for sure from people who have gotten in engagements is that you get sucked into the gunfighter, you get sucked into the target, um, you be, get uh, tunnel vision, okay? And you do not know what's going around on around you. You do not hear what people are yelling. You do not hear people yelling at you. You can not remember hearing the gunshots, even from your own weapon, even without ear protection. You can uh, definitely not count how many rounds you fired. Like all of this stuff is recorded nonstop. Um, cases of this happening all the time. That's focus. That's intense, intense focus, and it's not by choice. It's involuntary focus, your brain turning that on, telling you um, life-saving has to be done here, now. Don't think about anything else because this is the thing that's threatening you. Whereas in intense, uh, intense uh, rapidly changing environments, many things could be threatening you, and you need to be aware of that. Um, if you're a concealed carry citizen and you engage someone in public, what's another threat that could come at you? And and don't say, oh, another bad guy or ninjas could repel out of the out of the attic behind you. The biggest threat that you've got as a concealed carry citizen that is just engaged in a gunfight is a cop rolling up on the scene. That is a major concern because you will get shot if you are narrowly focused on a bad guy and someone's yelling drop the gun drop the gun and you don't hear them you don't hear them you don't understand what they're saying because you just shot this bad guy you don't understand why he doesn't then boom you get shot because you didn't drop the gun by the third or fourth command uh that's a legitimate problem focus causes problems like that focus is a lack of conditioning and training and orientation Attention can be divided. Um, another thing that I largely disagree with in the training world is attention versus focus when it comes to gross motor skills versus fine motor skills. Most people like to teach that you have to revert to gross motor skills because you're going to lose fine motor skills. I do not prescribe to that thought. I think that that's a very low standard to hold people to. I am absolutely 100% experientially convinced that you can operate fine motor skills just fine under intense amounts of stress. How you perceive the stress is the number one problem, which that is 100% the reorientation, which I won't get into in this episode. However, that is based on your perception of the problem, okay? How you process that stress is from the perception of your problem. Not not the stress itself. The stress is a symptom of your perception. Number two is your attention can be divided. So if I'm paying attention to this problem and I'm delivering the appropriate amount of force to that problem to, to take care of it, I can still understand if something goes wrong with my weapon, I need to do a fine man manipulation, um, my slide gets locked back prematurely, and I need, you know, because I've, I've intensified my grip, um, I can understand, you know, that I need to do a, a, a series of actions to fix that. Um, nothing about manipulating a slide lock or reloading a weapon is, is you know, contextually 100% gross motor movements those are those are um, very often include fine motor skills um, manipulating a, a 
fold or knife from your pocket. Um, you know, these things require fine motor skills. Fine motor skills, in my mind, come from the same part of the brain that makes fine on the fly decisions in a fight. Um, if you cannot control fine motor skills, you often will not be able to make very good decisions on the fly either. And it's not because you can't make decisions or you can't do these fine motor things. It's because your perception of the problem is causing you to get locked into a greater amount of focus and your attention cannot be divided to divert um, the appropriate amount of, of cognitive ability to the things, the other things that you're trying to do. So you get too focused on plan A or problem A and you cannot cognitively function enough to, to handle a simultaneous plan B or C or other things that you need to be doing. So attention is something that can be divided and you need to learn to develop high levels of attention. Um, this also gets into automaticity of fundamental skills. I don't have to think about things if I know how to do them at a at an automatic level. My fundamental skills and weapons manipulations and decision making for simple things like you know to reload the weapon and grab the magazine those things all are based on decisions and these things have to be done at at uh at an automatic level to do them you know simultaneously while you're solving another problem and paying attention to that but you do need to have a, a slice of attention given to those you they they're not going to be a hundred percent automatic there has to be a slice of attention of cognitive ability devoted to that so that if something goes wrong you can shift that attention over there if you cut it out of your focus completely and try to do it automatically you're 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 going to have problems when things go wrong um i've seen it happen in cqb class i've seen it happen in training in other areas i've seen it happen in real fights um so that's just a little uh, short thing about that um so I hope that was informative because there was uh, there was quite a few things in there to think about. Um, the next time that I do this podcast, I'm going to attempt to go live. This time, I didn't make it live because I wanted to uh, test all the equipment and get everything, get everything worked out and figure out the flow um, and figure out that I can actually talk behind a microphone sitting in my uh, little studio here, um, which I think I've done uh, successfully tonight. So... That being said, I'd like to thank you for listening tonight, and um, the next time I get on here, I will try to be available for chat real time during the broadcast so that I can interact with some of you, um, and you can ask questions, and I will do my best to answer them, and uh, we can have somewhat of a conversation going um, through the broadcast, which should... Um, bring quite a, uh, a level of, um, information out that I won't get by just sitting here and talking at a microphone. So until next time, uh, be safe out there and, uh, do everything you can to be a better person, uh, because that ultimately has a lot to do with how good of a warrior you are and how good of a leader you are as well. And take care.